you're right, this is about food and drink. Uh, yeah. We've got some old faces in the house here <laughs> who I recognise. <laughs> Hello, buddy, you're there. Uh, White Caves has just arrived at the back of the room there under the very nice IKEA lamps. Uh, <laughs> what else have we got? <laughs> we, we, we've got, uh, we've got Mr Bond. Yes, Mr. Bond, where are you in the world? Uh, I'm currently in Florida at the moment. Florida. Excellent. United okay. States. So uh, we've covered most time zones. We've had Russians, we've had Brazilians, we've had English, Welsh, Americans, Canadians, Spanish, French, Germans, Italians. We've had them all. Um, we've had even somebody in Oman. I think there was, was an Egyptian as well that was in at the very beginning of the day. So um, this is number 20 and another milestone reach. And I could actually overhear what I overheard when I came into the room, you're talking about people who were doing marathon VR sessions. Is that right? For a few <laughs> weeks, I heard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We were just yeah. talking about boring um... all-nighters, all-nighters online. We were just talking about how people are just, this kid over here, uh, uh, right here, um, Mr. Bond, he, he pulled <laughs> off uh, uh, three days without any sleep. Wow. Okay. That was actually me, but you know, whatever. That's okay. <laughs> no, who was yeah. it? Who no, was no, it? It was who Nick. Was it? That was that it was Nick. Nick in Canada. That's okay. There we go. Uh, yeah. Nick, all. I remember you making in Canada. You were on a dating game. All right, excellent, <laughs> buddy. Yeah. I'm going to come to you. Context, you, you, you should you should come up here probably towards the end of the day, and we're going <laughs> to give you the mic. But um, yeah, yeah, you're full of beans. No, that's great to it's see. Just a joke. All right. <laughs> So, yeah, that's right. Now the topic is food and drink. Let me just uh, adjust this a little bit and we're going to jump into the conversation because food and drink is what obviously brings us all together, isn't it? And everybody's got their favourite meal, their favourite thing to cook. Let's ask Margie, if I'm coming around to your house for dinner, what are you going to rustle me up? Probably um, lasagna. Oh, beautiful. Okay. And... Um, what about for dessert? You're not going to let me go out, go home without any dessert, are you? Oh no, we'd have. Um, hmm, we probably have ice cream. Okay, bit of ice cream for dessert. I do have a sweet tooth. Yeah. So there we go. Um, you don't happen to have any chocolate? Bit. Oh no, sorry, I'll stop talking about that. Yeah, chocolate right, so goes we, on top um, of the ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so we're, we're talking about food and drink, and this this first slide is uh, just. What's on the menu for you? So um, what time is it where you are, Margie? It is 12.04 a.m. 12.04. So you've had your, what, what did you have for dinner today? Pizza. <laughs> pizza. Good. <laughs> so you've had lasagna and pizza. Um, and we've, we've got a closet Italian uh, somewhere. And then we've got uh, Nick, Nick in Canada. What was on the menu for, for you today? I actually haven't eaten anything all day. <laughs> you haven't eaten? anything all day yeah oh no why <laughs> uh i have no idea just didn't think about it until now okay what's a typical well if we open your fridge what are we going to find inside um lots of frozen pizzas you know ramen noodles <laughs> uh <laughs> nothing too healthy um i do, do try to put a salad in there every now and then you know yeah. So I don't get scurvy. Um, <laughs> good. Yeah. It's a good time. Egg. Okay. Okay. But, and Margie, if we go around there, where she's going to cook us some lasagna, but uh, you, you, if you had to cook, there's a conditional structure for anyone filming this or listening to this. I'll get in front of the camera, but conditionals, which are important. Long time when I was in high school. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't use any of those skills. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So if you had to cook a romantic meal, what would it look like? Oh, what would it look like? Oh, let's see here. I would make, let's see here. Hmm. Hmm. Romantic meal. We know. can come back uh, to you if you want. Yeah, come back to me. I'm just thinking of the word. <laughs> Have a think. I know you've, you've not had much food today, so... You're running low on brain power, possibly. That's no problem. We've got such Jimmy's in the house. Hello, Jimmy. Good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Yeah, we're talking about the uh, 
about food and drink and we're talking about what's on the menu but let's just jump forward to this slide now does anybody know what this is Any ideas? Margie? We may have an issue with the slide. We're just seeing a blank black screen. Oh, you may have to re rejoin. Yeah, screen as well. Right, so, because I can see I it. So yeah, I just read the word I was thinking of was scones. Make some scones. Um, Ooh. What is yeah. that? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so thanks for thanks for that. If you cannot see the slides, can you give me a sad face if you cannot see the slides? Yeah, I'm going to re-enter okay. the space. I'll be back. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, buddy, if you can't see it, mate, you need to click the set uh, the menu, then settings, and then in the general part, it will say re-enter space. You should be able to come back and see that. So it's menu settings, re-enter space. Um, yeah, this is shepherd's pie. Does anybody know about Hi. shepherd's pie? Isn't it Scottish? Is it English? Possibly. Well, yeah, it, it, it's a great point. I, I don't know actually where it comes from. I mean, it's a British type of uh, meal, and it's something I basically grew up on breakfast, lunch, and dinner most days of the week. But uh, it's um, what, what do you think is the, the ingredients? What can you see on the top? Just shout out some food items. Cheese. Cheese. That's it. We've got some. They put some parsley on it just to make it look a little bit more sophisticated, but it's, it's normally just a bit of a massive slop on a plate, but it's really hearty and it's really, you just dig in and it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's great on a cold winter's evening. Um, so we've got the, the cheese on top, we've got the parsley, we've got then the mashed potato, so there's, there's P word there, and then under that, what can you see under the mash? That's it. Someone's talking. Um, yeah, we've got mm -hmm. that raise hand button on there. If you do want to speak, we can give you the megaphone so we can pick up your audio a little bit better. Um, so down on the bottom right there, just click raise hand and we can come to you. But yeah, that's a shepherd's pie. And uh, yeah, you someone's have peas and carrots as well. Um, Margie, what it, I mean, this, this reflects like a childhood food for me. We now live in a world where you can have ramen and uh, frozen pizzas day in, day out, mm -hmm. as Nick was talking about. But there's more traditional foods. What, what could you tell us about your where you are and how, what you grew up on? Hmm. Um, steak, mashed potatoes and gravy. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah, roast. Right. Roast. Roast. Yeah. Yeah. And was, that, was, that a Sunday, was that a Sunday type dinner or was it most yes. days of the week? Yeah. No, okay. it was Sunday. Yeah. Um, oh, and you're, you're the uh, barbershop singer. What's a good meal to have before, a, uh, before an event? Oh, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want people belching out there. <laughs> <laughs> no garlic. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Afterwards, <Okay>. though. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was just wondering whether there would be anything to kind of get the uh, the vocal cords warmed up. Maybe there's something warm to drink or, or cold. Throat sure. coat. Throat coat tea. No. Okay. It's called okay. throat coat. And that's yeah. what we usually what's, drink. What's that? It's a it's a tea. It's a brand of tea that is um, it's just very soothing. I'm sure it's got yes. some honey in it. It's very good. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. So yeah, we, uh, I grew up on this, um, shepherd's pie, um, and the other things as well. Like, so other typical food that I grew up, bangers and mash. Does anybody know that? Bangers and mash. What are bangers? Sausages. Sausages. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Do you say bangers in the U S? No. Nah. But yeah, it's uh, bangers and mash. So, and that was the classic meal that when my mum was working late, uh, then my dad was left with me and my two brothers and uh, he was left in charge of the kitchen. And, uh, and that was often uh, quite a traumatic experience for us young boys and, and my mum. And, uh, uh, and he used to just always cook bangers and mash, which is effectively just what well, you can see there, mashed potato on a plate, like a mountain of it. And, and he'd stick some tomato, not tomato, some, some sausages in the top, which kind of looked like a, almost like a hedgehog. And, uh, and he'd just slather it in gravy. And, uh, and that was it. So um, that was his speciality. Um, Mr. Bond, I'm going to come a bit closer to you because I think your oh, microphone's not on. Um, what, what did you grow up on? Oh, well, I did grow 
grew up in South Africa, so did you apply to the Sego Um I had a bunch of, like, we had chicken hearts. I, I can't explain it. I, I don't remember what the dish was called. It was like chicken hearts, and then we, it was kind of like shepherd's pie, but it had the, the meat of chicken hearts and all that in it. Wow. I can't remember the name. Okay. So you've got a bit of homework there as well. So we've got yes, Nick I trying do. to remember what he's going to cook. Sorry, yeah? Uh, I cook um, steak dinner. Sorry. Well, when it comes steak to cooking dinner. for a romantic, man, uh, that would be... Uh, chicken hearts? Is that a romantic meal? No, that's just what I grew up on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I would not make me. that. <laughs> Hungry as hell. I'll be back. Yeah, okay, Nick. Yeah, you grab something to eat. All right. Thanks, um... Mr. Bond, that's uh, yeah, a nice insight into your culture and different food items. So people here who might watch this in the future on the YouTube videos, on the left, uh, your left, we've got the shepherd's pie. We've got mince meat, that's M-I-N-C-E, and meat, which is uh, in the uh, under the mashed potato with the melted cheese on top, the golden melted cheese. Um, and uh, and that's the, the, the filling there is filled with carrots and vegetables, just to make it a bit more healthy and on the right we've got the recipe here or the ingredients at least i should say for the shepherd's pie and as you can see we've got one tbsp which is tablespoon obviously you've got a teaspoon which is just i think tsp if i'm not mistaken of that sunflower oil we've then got a one large onion chopped so chopped just means kind of cut very roughly um and then you've got uh, two to three medium carrots and you can see some of them in there again chopped uh, it's not a precise science, you know, this type of food, it's family cooking, it's everybody in the kitchen, and you just bung it all in, you throw it all in the pan or in the oven, and you see what comes out the other end. So it doesn't need to be very sophisticated. Uh, the, the level of sophistication, the maximum is that little sprinkling of parsley. There we go, and a nice tablecloth. Uh, we've got 500 grams of lamb uh, uh, mint. Now, Margie, vegetarianism, is that something that scares you? Um... I have several friends that are vegetarians. Yeah. And that's, you that's about as close as I get to it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah, so uh, you wouldn't touch veggies. So for you, you, you like your uh, you like your steaks, your sausages? I'm a carnivore, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, great. So this is very much a meal for carnivores. And then we've got the <laughs> tomato puree. We discussed before ketchup uh, sometime earlier today, passata, the, uh, type of, the more traditional, uh, let's say, pure tomato sauce form, but puree as well is a similar type of that. We've got a large splash. There's a nice keyword there for you today as well, a splash of uh, Worcester sauce. There we go, Worcester sauce, and 500 milliliters of beef stock. Uh, Margie, do you make your own stock, or do you buy it from the supermarket? Um, I buy it. Yeah, okay. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but if you, uh, it's also the basting as well. That's, I think, one word we could use when you've got that uh, chicken or the, the lamb in the oven. You can kind of dip your spoon in there every 10 minutes or so, just give it a cover, and you're just basting it in its juices. You can then later use those juices uh, and put it over your roast potatoes or your spuds, as we say in England. So, okay, we've, uh, we've got the 900 grams of potatoes, almost a kilo of those cut into chunks. I said another word there, spud. S-P-U-D, which is a slang word for potato. Uh, and then we've got 885 grams of butter and three tablespoons of milk. So it's pretty rich, uh, pretty heavy. But as I said before, it's not always very nice weather in my country. So this is exactly what you need on a cold winter or autumn night. Um, we've got some other people here. I'm going to ask uh, um, Nick's, Nick's having something to eat. Paulie, are you there? Can you hear us? You're in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Oh, there we go. I'm going to put you on megaphone. I'll um, do it. Paulie, could you... Yeah, thanks. I'm in Canada, and I love lasagna. Very nice. <laughs> you love it. Can you cook it? That's the big question. Yes, although I prefer to buy the one from the supermarket that is already pre-cooked and yes. usually what I do is add on 
some extra sauce or spices to the to the top. Very nice. Very, very nice. You, I, the homemade is... tastes better, but the pre-made yes. ones from the from the supermarket are just very convenient. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, convenient. Mr. Bond, you've raised your hand very politely. We're going to come to you and give you the, the megaphone. Um, talk to us a bit more about the food you the food you ate out there in South Africa growing up. So you mentioned chicken hearts, for example. Uh, other types of things. What did you eat? So um, I, of course, I did eat the sago pudding. Um, I ate, uh, yes. um, I did have lasagna and I have had shepherd's pie all over, like I eat uh -huh. a wide range of food, but um, I actually found the name of that chicken hearts recipe here. Um, huh. It's called chicken hearts with mushrooms and it has the entire ingredients list here. I don't know if you want to know that, but <laughs> I did find it. Yeah. What are the main ingredients? Obviously, <laughs> mustard and chicken hearts. Yeah. What else? Onions, garlic? It's got two tablespoons of vegetable oil. It's got okay. one uh, small onion, minced. Um, one pound of chicken hearts, of course. A uh, half pound of mushrooms, uh, quartered or sliced. And then we got salt and freshly ground black pepper that gets put on top of it. Okay. Mm. Well, my taste buds are dripping already, and it's 20 past five in the morning, and I could murder a chicken heart right now. Um, we, we've got, um, uh, we, we've got uh, some keywords there that Mr. Uh, Bond came up with, and it's freshly ground black pepper, which is a great you know, way to add some color to your language. So if anyone, again, is watching this video in the future and wants to learn how to improve the way you talk about food, you've got some wonderful ingredients up there. You could talk about spuds or potatoes. We've got tomato puree. We've got the keyword chopped sunflower oil, tablespoon, teaspoon, and, of course, freshly ground. So please don't forget those. And another thing is where if you're sitting in language exams, is try to visualize this type of food as well. It's really difficult, maybe, in an exam when you're sitting opposite someone who's grilling you, uh, if you excuse the pun in this context, and they're grilling you to ask you particular questions about your language. What you could do is just try to conjure up, bring up an image of, like, you know, a shepherd's pie or some chicken heart, something you grew up on as a young uh, boy or girl, and then try to communicate what that was like, the smells and the sounds as well as your parents were maybe cooking that in the kitchen. So, there's a little tip for you. Um, we've got a uh, a number come up here. Um, Don, did you want to say anything? Or did I just I just that? have a question now that yeah. we're talking about this. Um, you say tomato and I say tomato. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you, how do you, it is, is there a right way? How do you teach people um, that may want to know how to pronounce something? Is it depend on yeah. where you are? Great question, yeah. You know, there's no right or wrong. At the end of the day, we're talking about accents really here, aren't we? Um, I think a lot of the time, or, yeah, I mean, okay, different pronunciations of words as well uh, will come into it. But at the end of the day, I'm from London, uh, southern England, so, you know, I speak a certain way, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong the way you speak, or Mr. Bond okay. over there, or Paulie speaks, or Nick in Canada, uh, or even Donna, who's floating out there looking out of the window. So, yeah, it's, uh, there's no right or wrong when it comes to that. Um, uh, you know, there are certain things that consistency so what I would say is everyone uh, needs to try to stick to one type of thing so if you're going to write your Z's or Z's as we say in the UK with your uh, for example um, I'm trying to think of a word with a, a Z for example organization with a Z or mm -hmm. a Z then, uh, then you should stick to doing that throughout the text or if you're speaking with a certain pronunciation of a word like for example I don't know car uh, maybe rounding the tongue maybe you want to kind of continue that theme rather than mixing up British and American English so I, I would say that is consistency, particularly in the writing, is key with spelling American English. Because you drop you you drop the U's, don't you, when you write, for example, favor or flavor that would not contain a U. Is that right? Probably not yes. in the same um, yeah. finesse in which you do it. Yeah. So I mean, it yeah, is, we like, we drop a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. flavor. Yeah, yeah, we go right to sure. Yeah, it's um, so yeah, there are differences, but um, all right, good. Let, let's crack on then with the, the next. So I'm just gonna pop over to the computer. Michael, I don't know if it's me or is your microphone getting a little choppy? Uh, can you let's ask the others. Is this mic okay? Fine? No, 
you can be so happy with faces if you can hear me clearly. Is it chat? Testing, okay. testing. One, two. Testing. Okay. Do you need me to re enter the space, maybe? I, I think it. so. I think yeah. that okay. Okay. By a second, let's go. We'll eat while you're gone. <laughs> Um, my, I'm cooking. I'm in the process of cooking a pizza. Oh, what are you cooking? I'm cooking pizza. a pizza. This guy. <gasps> my kind of guy. I really got him. All right. So just the three of us? Oh. Yeah. Just. I think so. There we go. I thought, I thought you were going to break into that famous song, Just the Three of Us. Was <laughs> that the name? Or just the two of us? <laughs> yeah, well, we were talking uh, about uh, what we were having to eat while you were gone. <laughs> Oh yeah, well that's the topic, and and now we've got Ooh, uh, don't good. fork around. Um, so this is, this looks like uh, a bit of mash and meat um, with again a bit of garnish. They just can't help themselves, can they? Put a green leaf on top of something, and they can give you some ten times. Um, but there we go. Uh, don't fork around. Uh, should we ask uh, somebody to read? Uh, Mr. Bond, would you mind reading that, please, for us? The text. Hang on. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Don't fork around. You probably think a fork should be used to spare food from your plate in order to place it in your mouth. Not in Thailand. However, where it is considered crude and low class to eat this way, where everybody knows the only use for this utensil is to push food in to a spoon, which is then placed into the mouth. Mm. Very good. Thanks very much. Yeah. So just the key words again, just to focus our attention on it. Obviously, you've got fork, which is uh, a utensil uh, or a uh, an item of cutlery. That's C-U-T-L-E-R-Y. So you've got fork, knife and spoon. It should be used. That's the passive. Yeah. So you're not saying that uh, you should use it. It's the passive. In other words, an object should be used by someone. And we can cover the passive as well in a moment, the grammar structure there. But that's quite useful to spear. Like, for example, you've got a knife or a dagger and you're spearing, uh, stabbing something. Um, spear food in, from your plate in order to place it into your mouth. But they don't do that in Thailand. What do they do there? However, where it's considered crude, which means very rude and low class to eat in this way. When everybody knows the only use for this utensil is another nice word there on this subject is to push food onto a spoon, which is then placed into the mouth. So, um, yeah. Uh, has anybody visited a culture where they don't use these utensils or cutlery, like knives, forks and spoons? Margie, have you ever been to maybe China, Japan? No. No? Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. And what do they use out there? What's the, uh, what's the key word that you could use? We use chopsticks. Chopsticks, someone said. Yeah, that's it. Chopsticks mm -hmm. is the word. And... Um, yeah, it's kind of, uh, have, you, have you ever tried eating lasagna with a chopstick? No, <laughs> but I've used chopsticks. Okay. I have no yeah. problem with that, but it'd be, yeah. okay. it'd be a challenge to do that with lasagna. Exactly, especially picking up all that garnish and parsley. <laughs> um, we've, yeah. um, Nick in Canada, have you had your dinner? Uh, I'm in the process. It'll be ready in okay. like, uh, okay. see here. If you raise your hand, Nick, we can hear you a bit more clearly. Oh, oh. Here, put no, your I'll microphone. You. <laughs> I'm good. Oh, there we go. Oh. I'll Great. get you. All right, well, I didn't really have anything else to say. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I didn't really have, I have anything else to say, you know. <laughs> okay, no problem. No, I just wanted to make sure you'd had your dinner. So, yeah, we're looking at some <laughs> keywords. We've got utensil, we've got fork, we've got cutlery, and we've got the passive as well. So let me just quickly cover this grammatical point as well for anybody that might watch this video in the future, or you might want to know yourself. So the passive is used for, particularly in situations when you don't know, for example, who did something. So, for example, I know uh, my phone has been robbed uh, or my phone has been stolen. So has been stolen, not by you, 
but by someone. So you're focusing on the objects. And the second situation is indeed that. So it's not only when you don't know who did something, for example, uh, the bank was robbed, but it's also when it's maybe more important to focus on the action rather than who did it. So for example, the chocolate cake was made to perfection. You don't maybe in a situation want to talk about who made it. And the third situation, you might use the passive as well, is to be um, maybe like to uh, get rid of responsibility. So for example, if you're at work and anyone writes work emails, you could actually say something like, um, the work will be done by five o'clock tonight. And that's a good way of saying that, not that you would do it so that they come and you know uh, uh, kind of contact you later. You could say, the work will be done, passive, by someone later on today. So that's three situations we would use the passive structure. That's the passive voice. If you want to learn more about that, you can have a Google or contact me on, uh, on the final website, goldlotus.co, and we can meet in all space, roomy, uh, or engage wherever you want in a virtual realm in the metaverse, and we can explain a bit more about that and use some of the uh, tools around us to uh, understand a bit more in context how to apply that grammar. So there's just a little plug for Gold Lotus and the project and, uh, and these virtual environments. So let's jump forward to the next slide and see what type of vocabulary and grammar we've got. Uh, here we go. Slurp loud, slurp proud. And again, if you can't see that, click on the <laughs> settings and you can re-enter the space. So slurp is a great word. That kind of sound right there, which is uh, not very polite to do in restaurants in uh, the Western world. But um, here we go. While you probably consider slurping noodles to be rude, uh, this is not the case in Japan. Interesting. In fact, slurping is not only acceptable, but encouraged. So actually, they want you to do it as it's believed to improve the noodles flavor and oh. considered to be evidence that you've enjoyed your meal. So there we go. If you didn't know that already, uh, you you do now and uh, we're just to before we get into discussing that we've got the second line from the bottom there the penultimate line is noodles with an apostrophe at the end um, so we use that in situations when you've got the plural noun for example noodles is plural and then you just stick the apostrophe at the end to talk about the the possessive like the flavor of the noodles so you might have situations for example if you have um, I don't know uh, let's say uh, two cats and the cats uh, they share the food and you say the cats apostrophe c-a-t-s apostrophe food so the food which belongs to those two cats plural if it's obviously one cat then it could be c-a-t apostrophe s with the apostrophe before the s so that's just an important thing to remember and when you read text like this it's really important to just try and focus on the small details like we discussed with matt the vr ceo earlier on in the previous lesson and with the in the writing class about 10 hours ago over in the back there um, it's really important to focus on the details so don't watch a two hours of tom cruise and nicole kidman kissing or fighting aliens or something just focus maybe on two minutes of a video and meditate on it and maybe meditate on a simple paragraph like that rather than reading the works of dostoevsky to improve your english uh, we've got free fun has just entered the room free fun welcome Hi, can good. you hear me excellent uh can you i'm going to put your megaphone and for about 25 hours, I've been saying, and I didn't realize until about two minutes ago, we can actually put them on megaphone without asking them to raise their hand. I don't believe it. Anyway, that's my fault. Free fun, where are you from? <laughs> I, am, I, I live currently in Malaysia. Oh, what, what, oh sorry. Why? <laughs> You're in Malaysia at the moment. Uh, where are you from originally? I haven't disclosed this information for anyone. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I That's was right. living in Canada and I moved to Malaysia like a few weeks ago. And how are you finding it so far? I uh, I moved in the wrong time, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think you probably did. There we go. Well, listen, a pandemic, you only get one about one every hundred years. So you, you once this one's over, you should be fine for the next 99. Yeah. Uh, don't worry about it. Stay positive. We've got Disney Guy 4 in the house. I don't know where Disney Guy 3, 2 and 1 is, but welcome to you. You might want to... Hello, Disney Guy. Okay, good. So we're talking about food. And uh, you're in Malaysia, uh, Free Fun. So um, what about slurping food? Because that's something that is not really something that we do in Canada, the UK or Italy, where I am right now. But do you slurp your food in Malaysia, do you think? 
Oh, excuse me. Yeah, do you, um, do you, you know, slurp your food? When you eat your food, do you do that? Uh, no. No, you don't. I wouldn't do that. No. <laughs> okay. Well, well in Japan they do. Oh, God. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. I, I don't Good. like Asian food anyway, so... <laughs> okay. All right. Well, no slurping for you then. Let's move on. <laughs> Let's have a... <laughs> Let's have a look and see what we've got here on the next slide regarding food. And yeah, we're moving back now a bit towards uh, a bit closer towards Europe and uh, uh, away from Asia. And we've got uh, Middle Eastern cultures encourage eating with one's hands, but that doesn't mean all hands are created equal. Interesting. In fact, the right hand, the hand that I'm using here right now with the laser, it is, uh, is reserved for handling food and reaching for food, so stretching moving your arm forward with the left hand is considered to be an insult to one's host and again we're seeing the passive so the penultimate line there is and then the last line considered to be that's the passive so you've got it's considered by people it's not you're not saying people consider it you're saying it is considered to be so it's create the passive there you've got the verb to be in the present is plus the past participle, the past form. And if you notice that, if we talk about, for example, the phone was stolen, there you've got the verb be, was in the past, and you've got the past form of steal, which is stolen. It's always the same structure, okay, whether you talk about the, uh, the passive. And uh, if anybody's got any questions about the grammar, you can uh, jump right in. Otherwise, I'm gonna plow on and talk about Middle Eastern cuisine. So we spoke about curry a few hours ago with Rohit uh, Chabe, I hope I'm saying that correctly, a guy from India, and he was talking about curry and hot food. We spoke with, uh, uh, we, we saw a moment ago about noodles and that, and uh, we heard about Margie's lasagna. But what about Middle Eastern cuisine, Margie? Is there, are there Middle Eastern restaurants near you? There are. Um, I, it's not my favorite. But I've, I've gone with friends, but it wouldn't. Yeah. It's just different than yes. I'm used to. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's some kind of interesting things. Yeah, with like the, there's some beautiful kind of these like pastries or kind of uh, almost like phyllo pastry uh, delicacies, desserts. So and we've got some walnuts there. Again, uh, more vocabulary. We've got a bowl of opened walnuts. We've got the walnuts in their shells. Uh, uh, already cracked open and uh, some keywords from this paragraph of text you've got the uh, what could we say um, well cultures Middle Eastern uh, encourage eating so um, good I don't think we can say much more about that slide but yeah that's just a little interesting cultural nugget that if you're going to eat in the Middle East you're going to want to eat with your right hand and not your left uh, so let's move forward to the next one and Right, we do have a few North Americans here. Um, <laughs> what can we say about this? Margie, could you read that slide, please? Okay. Fish is never cheesy. Most North Americans think nothing of adding grated Parmesan to a plate of shrimp, linguine, or some other type of seafood pasta. But this is unheard of in Italy, where the idea of combining cheese and seafood is seen as a culinary catastrophe. Very good. Do you grate <laughs> so cheese nice. on your It is, yeah. Is that something that you do? Cheese on fish? Yeah, I definitely do that. Yeah. Can we get some hearts and claps if you put cheese on fish? Yeah, excellent. Right, we've identified them, haven't we? Get them, kick them out. Uh, good. There we go. And no, there's nothing wrong with that in all space. But I tell you, if Italians, there's no Italians here right now, but and they, the one in my house is fast asleep, so I can get away with saying this, that they, it, it, it's criminal to do that. We spoke about ketchup earlier in Italy, and uh, the thought of putting ketchup on uh, on, on food is... Uh, is uh, absolutely a big no-no. But uh, for some reason, certain cultures, certain people, they do stuff that other people do not. And this is one thing that in North America, and I must say as well, in the UK, I've seen one or two times, is putting, uh, now you say Parmesan uh, in America, I think, uh, sorry for my terrible accent, we say Parmesan in um, 
in the UK. I forgot where I was from there after 20 hours. And, uh, and we've got there another key word from the Italian language. This is linguine, a type of pasta. We've got shrimp and uh, or some other type of seafood pasta. This is unheard of in Italy, as we said there, where the idea of combining cheese and seafood, it seems like a culinary catastrophe. Now, another thing that they do not do in Italy, but we absolutely do in the UK and US and Canada and other parts of the world, is the Hawaiian pizza. Uh, Nick from Canada, you're the pizza expert, aren't you? Do you want to talk to us about the Hawaiian? What's that? Oh, Hawaiian pizza is amazing. I love it. You know, you know, cheese, then you got the pineapple, just makes it so delicious. A lot of people say that pineapple pizza is um, a catastrophe. You know, people say that it's it's a sin to eat pineapple pizza, but I love pineapple pizza. You know, I'm going to go to hell for it. I don't care. <laughs> That's all right. No problem with that. And uh, yeah, Margie, well, you wanted to add something there. Oh, just enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> I'd vote, vote for pineapple. Any, any kind of oh, pizza. Yeah. But I like pineapple pizza too. Listen, the combination of fruit and uh, ham, that saltiness with the sweetness, you just mm-hmm. can't beat. I don't understand what the Italians don't understand about it. Um, yeah, but, I agree. Uh, yeah. All right. And it's the same. It's pretty great. It, the, um, what, uh, what are the other things? I remember in the past, pie, uh, the cheese and the pineapple. I mean, if they, if they accept that, why not the next step, which is the the uh, the, the Hawaiian pizza. Now, but this is the other thing as well. I noticed in Italy that they, they did an interesting one. It's, it's, a, it's a cheese called scamorza or scamorza in my terrible English accent. And that's like a smoked cheese. I'm trying to think. It's kind of a relatively uh, kind of rubbery cheese. Uh, it goes down quite easily. It's not, it's not really tough, but they have that with uh, raisins. And I can definitely recommend that as well. So you can grab a cheese and stick a bunch of sultanas or raisins on top. That's a great combination as well. But yeah, we've got a big no-no. I mean, I'm trying to think of other no-nos around the world in terms of food. We've got somebody at the back there. It's Claudia Isom. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, if you want to introduce yourself, wave your hand around and we can give you the mic. Uh, we've got Aaron who's just entered the room. Aaron, give us a wave. Yeah, well, no, he's gone. Okay. He's a quiet bunch today. But uh, the lesson does plow on. And we have got the next slide talking about food. And uh, here we go. What have we got prepared here? Now, I've stumbled across this a few years ago, and this is going to be one for the pizza lovers out there. Now, this is the gold pizza. And uh, as you can see, it's actually offered by pizzagogo.co.uk. Um, do you have Pizza Gogo in America? Or is it only in the UK? No, I'm in Canada. We okay. Not heard of that. Yeah, I've not you, heard you, of it. All right. Well, you've got Domino's, you, you, Pizza Hut. I don't know if they're still going strong. Uh, my uncle yeah. used to work for Pizza Hut, um, and it was uh, we ate so much pizza, I got sick of it at the end because he, he and uh, he would bring it home every after every shift. But uh, yeah, this is oh a gold God. pizza from a, a pizza chain called Pizza Go Go. It is five hundred pounds. That's about maybe uh, five hundred fifty US dollars, maybe uh, about five hundred fifty euros, whatever your currency is. And uh, you've got twenty three carat gold flakes on top of the pizza. You've got white truffle oil. Uh, you've got caviar, lobster, and fantail prawns. So there you go. You've got the whole shebang. Uh, you don't have any parsley, unfortunately, or any grated chocolate biscuits. Um, I really am losing my mind now talking more and more about chocolate biscuit, but it includes. And the great thing is this price, okay, it includes not just the wonderful ingredients on top, it also includes the red carpet delivery. And what they do when they bring it to your door, they roll out a red carpet, the pizza delivery guy, and they bring it to your front door or your, your apartment door. Uh, on a red carpet. And it also is yet the butler service at your location. So they'll take, I don't know if they actually wear something. Aaron, uh, oh, this is Radu McPhee. Radu McPhee, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, we're gonna give you the mic because you wanna say something. Here we go. Uh, off you go. What do you wanna say? Uh, so what is this about? <laughs> Good question. I wish I knew the answer. No, this is 24-hour English lesson. 
Um, this is hour 20 of 24. Uh, I'm Michael. I'm an English teacher from London, living in Italy. And as you can see by the, the walls and images around me, we're just doing this to gather people to raise awareness for the fight against coronavirus in Italy, which has been very, hit very, very hard. And of course, other communities around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope that you are OK. Where, where are you in the world at the moment? He's lost for words. Where are you? Should we give him the mic? Or give it back to you? Sorry, I muted you. Where are you? Uh, I'm in um, uh, the United States right now. Okay, yeah. And I assume you've been uh, stuck at home for some time now, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I uh, hope that's going well. Uh, but yeah, if, you, um, if you're interested to find out more, I'll bring up the slides in about uh, 15 minutes when we come to the end of this. But we're talking about food and uh, food and drink at the moment. We spoke about photography last lesson. You sound like you speak English fantastically, but it's just a great way to maybe hear other people around the world reading and discussing these topics of food. Margie to your left was talking about her um, the, her lasagna, and Nick to the right uh, to the left of you, he's a fan of frozen pizzas, and that's what we're talking about right now. It's this 500 pound, 600 US dollar pizza. So, which has got gold flakes on it, truffle oil and caviar and lobster. So there we go. Um, and Joseph is back in the house. Good to see you again. Um, so, yeah, this is, you know, I mean, this is crazy, isn't it? £500 per pizza. Um, does anybody out there, what's the most expensive meal you've ever had? Have you been to a classy restaurant at the back there? Mr. Bond, tell us, a uh, classy restaurant, a uh, five star, uh, I don't know, how many Michelin, is it three Michelin stars these days? I can't keep up. Yeah. What do you want to say? Here, hang on. Whoops. Okay. Sorry. That's all right. I'm there trying to go. give him the. Uh, there we go. There you go. Can you hear me? He's got it. Yep. Yeah. So the most expensive meal that I've had was Ratatouille, and that's just because I went. I watched the movie Ratatouille, and I wanted to taste it. It was. Um. Thirty-four dollars, and it was so small. I I didn't know <laughs> why it was so small, but yeah. Yeah, this you're right. There's a strange. I, I wish I could kind of bring up a graph here, but it's almost like the um the more sophisticated a location is for eating or dining out, the smaller the proportions of the or the portion proportions become. It's like a direct correlation. Uh, the more sophisticated it is, the less food they give you. I don't understand that. And my parents to celebrate, uh, I think it was my dad's 50th birthday uh, a, a few years ago, they went to the, uh, I think it was the Ritz Hotel, which one of the kind of more classy hotels in London that often tourists like to go to. And um, they, they went there and uh, to celebrate this and they, they'd had a, a long day walking around and shopping in that in central London. They sat down for the meal. It was like, literally like one roast potato on the, t on, the uh, <laughs> on the plate with like some kind of exotic jus or juice kind of spread over it. But uh, Margie, what's the most expensive meal you've had? <laughs> I um, lovingly took my niece and her daughters to Brennan's in New Orleans and oh, wow. um, did not realize <laughs> um, how expensive it was there, but it ended up being $250. By the wow. time we were down Ouch. and okay. it was lovely i mean it was wonderful yeah. it was one time in a lifetime i was able to do it so but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well forget the italian red cross we should raise funds for you to to, <laughs> to try and recoup. So, um, we'll, we'll sort out a gofundme page don't worry about that um yeah you know there's um food as i said at the top of the hour it really does bring people together doesn't it and uh, in, in other ways and there's something actually really nice it's just kind of hey, we're going to get a little bit kind of teary-eyed and romantic now but it's nothing nice and giving someone a christmas present and seeing them unwrap it Birthday, but it's the same with meals. You know, if you take someone out or you buy them stuff, and it doesn't even have to be two hundred and fifty dollars. It could just be, you know, like just handing them a nice sandwich that you've bought from around the corner. You know, it's, it just brings people together. Um, we've got somebody else. Tam, welcome. Can you can you hear me clearly? Do you want to give us a wave? Hi, Tam. She's clicking around. Look at her. 
All right, we're going to jump forward to the next slide now. And uh, as we approach the home straight, we've picked up an awful lot of vocabulary today. And um, this is another experience which is uh, becoming more and more common. Um, and what do you think this picture represents? Tumbleweed just moving past. Fine dining. No, no. That's fine. fine dining. Hang on, Nick. Well, manners banquet. What do you guys think? You know, Eating in the Nick, dark. Nick, you're on megaphone. <laughs> oh, it, dining in the dark. Oh, every time. All right. Um, I think, yeah, it's maybe fine dining because I see that. I grew up in. Um, my grandparents were very English. I see that you have the fork on one side and then the the knife and the spoon on the other side. So it's definitely a very classic dinner. Um, I don't see any napkin um, on the on sure. the fork. I don't see any napkins. That 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 definitely indicates something else for me. But I don't know. Definitely fine dining. Yeah. That's my best guess. I find it very interesting that there's a spoon, but not a dessert fork. Because where I'm from, there's always two forks for a dessert. There's actually three forks. So a dessert, main course, and then a salad fork. And then usually it has one knife. So I'm finding that very interesting that there's a spoon there. I don't know what the spoon would be for. That's a great point. Yeah, and you've picked up on a very small but subtle thing there, and I, and I don't have the answer. If anybody does, feel free to chip in or chime in, and uh, we'll try to get to the bottom of this. Uh, otherwise, have a Google. But yeah, on the left, you've got there a utensil. We saw that word a few times uh, recently. That's U-T-E-N-S-I-L, uh, or a, an item of cutlery. This is cutlery in front of us, the fork and the spoon. Um, there's the word then for dishes and plates and bowls and cups, and it's not cutlery, that's crockery. So anybody is listening now, maybe not an English, uh, native English speaker, you might not know those words. So crockery, that's C-R-O-C-K-E-R-Y, uh, is uh, plates and uh, bowls and uh, maybe platters, etc., cups and mugs, that's crockery. But cutlery is what you're looking at there. And actually you do maybe, I don't know if, I think we call that maybe glassware. I don't know if that would be classed as... Uh, crockery the glass there but yeah this is dining in the dark and um mr bond to you uh, i don't know if james is your first name but um certainly by the second name we could come to you probably well traveled um and as as you indeed are you said you're from south africa originally now have you ever dined in the dark before um i do occasionally um when it when i get that midnight munchies so <laughs> I have I Good. usually don't use utensils when I dine in the dark because it would be a travesty as I would miss <laughs> everything that I'm trying to get to. <laughs> You're right. You just get hands on. Okay. Uh, is it just me or is he for Diddy Freeze? I think you froze. Well, good news, everyone. I got my pizza. A. Hey. Oh, he disconnected. Let's give him a few minutes. There we go. Yeah, give me a few minutes. <laughs> um, did we yeah right we're rack uh, I think you can, can you hear me clearly yeah yep perfect great um, I've, I think that we're, I don't think we're in double figures yet for me being kicked out by the internet connection I'm in double figures for booting people out of the room for doing silly things uh, we're in certainly double figures for the number of hours we've been in here. We're in double figures of the nationalities. We're racking up all of these uh, these statistics, Mr. Bond. I'm sorry, you you were saying that you don't dine in the uh, in the dark with the cutlery, which is very wise advice, especially when knives are involved, and um, you just get hands up on for those midnight munchies. But we're talking here about maybe a different experience where you actually go to a restaurant. 
and he would dine in the dark. And why do you think people would do that? Any ideas? We've got Mr. Tacos just entered. If you want to say anything about Steve, oh, I recognize that name. Um, or, uh, Margie, do you want to, do you want to add something? He's dining in the dark. Why, why would people do that? Romantic. Romantic. Yeah. Sure. Well, um, um, I think it's to uh, experience flavors in a different way. Because, like, when you're in the dark, you can't necessarily see what you're eating. So you might want to imagine what you're eating, experience it in a new light. That's my take on it. That's yes, good yeah, take. sure. So different experience, sure, more romantic. Um, good. Um, that's right. And I think it's probably why they do it. You know, this is, it's, it probably relates to the whole just experiential thing about about going into a restaurant, doing something that's very alien. And I guess another thing if on the subject of food and drink, and actually we should have asked this question to Rohit earlier, a few hours ago, the Indian guy living out in the US and building out a great uh, technology business out there. And um, uh, you know, he was talking about curry, but we never actually asked him the question how he consumes that food, because in many cultures around the world, they use the hands, don't they? And they don't have even the chopsticks. Um, and that's a very different experience itself. And I remember once, um, I, can't, I think I might have just moved to flats or something, and I didn't have any washing up liquid. But anyway, I was using my hands to eat food to, that I ordinarily wouldn't do. I think it's some pasta or gnocchi. And uh, I just remember it's just a really kind of deeper connection to it. You're kind of getting your hands dirty, or you're putting it in your mouth. I don't know if anybody's ever tried that before, but we've kind of maybe been detached from the fruit, food through these utensils. Um, uh, but yeah, it is cleaner, but there's always a bit of soap and a towel to use, so why not use them? Um, if anyone wants to jump in, we've got about three more minutes before we prepare the slides for the next uh, presentation. Does anybody want to say anything? Steve-O, hi. Uh, you're not muted. You're in a, do you want to add anything, Steve-O, to anything we've said? Uh, I'm just trying to understand it all. I came in really, really late on this one. I might uh, hang tight. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Thanks for your honesty. So this is our 20 of 24, uh, just to keep you uh, informed about what's going on here, because I do appreciate all spaces. One of the great things, you've got a lot of passing traffic. So you can see above there, the Red Cross of Italy, uh, um, uh, the area of Lecce, which is in southern Italy. I'm going to bring up a slide here to show you a little bit more about where that's located and why we're standing here today, because thanks to the educators in VR community, that's the educators in VR dot com and Margie's part of that and then one of the moderators and community members over there by a the window and a great barbershop singer we saw earlier in the video will be uploaded on YouTube uh, later on. We are putting on this event as a marathon VR English lesson to cover a whole range of topics, get a load of international special guests. We're into, into double fingers, as I've said, in terms of countries represented, languages and cultures. And uh, so you've stumbled across something uh, quite interesting because you know I could have stood here on my own banging on about food and drink and uh, Indian food food and travel and photography all day long but actually who was really made is these interactions so thank you everybody for coming uh, it would not genuinely have been possible without you um, you can see up there on the slides there that's where Lecce is and that's in the deepest part of Italy and it's been kind of uh, really starting to feel the wave hit from the northern part of Italy which has suffered hugely as I think many of your countries have as well from this coronavirus so um, I'm just doing my little bit here to try to raise some awareness and funds for the volunteers and I want to underline that word these are volunteers people going out off their own back putting themselves in the line of fire in order to try to stop the spread and when pandemics aren't hitting the world they're, they're helping people arriving on the southern coast of Italy there in dinghies and swimming ashore from northern parts of Africa and Sicily and they're giving them you know food and uh, and shelter because they've made that that journey over um, so you know please do support uh, the communities around you in any kind of charitable work they're doing if you're interested in um, donating uh, we the the uh, the we're trying to get to two thousand euros. We're about one hundred and fifty euros short. So listen, we've got about ten people in the room. If if you put two euros in each, for example, that's already twenty euros, and we're all like a quarter of the way there, and we've still got another three four hours. So I'd love to get that to two thousand euros, please. Because if I just go back to 
one of the previous slides, if you see here on the right there, the nose protective suit, it only costs 30 euros to have the fully protective suit. So you can see how far your money goes. And even two euros is going to cover the cost of that pair of those blue gloves, which is so key to stopping the spread. So listen, if you don't want to donate, no pressure. This event is still going to go forward for another few hours. Thanks for coming. And uh, maybe just a nudge in the direction of thinking about how you could help people around you. Uh, maybe ask your neighbours if they need a bit of shopping on cat food or a bottle of milk. So there we go. We're going to have a short break now for five minutes. I'm going to grab a bottle of water and, uh, and a cereal bar. No more chocolate biscuits left. I'll run out of the packet. So we're now on to cereal bars and, uh, and I'm going to be back in this space in the next four to five minutes to talk about the next subject which is if I'm remembering clearly I think it's inventions so we're going to be talking about the past present and future of inventions let's just jump forward to that and a second sorry I'm going to give you a bit of a headache I'm going to look at some of the crazy inventions as well around the world and there we go.